Hello and welcome to the Choral Conductors Colloquium, Volume 1, Lecture 4. My name is Raul Dominguez and I will be your host and moderator. Before we begin, please note, this webinar is being recorded and will be posted in the near future on our YouTube channel. We are waiting on one final confirmation before we post the lectures by Dr. Galvan and Dr. Sparks. Thank you for your continued patience. The University of Colorado Boulder is now offering credit and certificates through their Department of Continuing Education for those who attend all five lectures. Details on how to apply can be found in your next colloquium e-blast. Today's lecture will be about one hour long, followed by a 15 minute question and answer session. Please submit your questions at any time using the Q&A button found in your toolbar. Priority will be given to questions about today's topic and questions submitted to the chat room will not be considered. Thank you to our sponsors, Sue Bear, Jeffrey Nitch and the Entrepreneurship Center for Music, and faculty sponsor, Director of Choral Studies, Dr. Gregory Gentry from the University of Colorado Boulder. Now it is my sincere privilege to welcome the Professor of Choral and Vocal Studies at Winston-Salem State University, Maestra Dawala Simmons Burke, music speaking truth to power and seeking justice. <laughs> afternoon. I am Dawala simmons Burke, and I am elated to be here to share with you today. And again, the topic is music, speaking truth to power and seeking justice. The intent of this discussion or this talk is to propose that music is a great equalizer and not a divider. This is my truth while I'm seeking justice. So let's talk a minute. The academy and systemic racism. You've heard that phrase being used quite a bit nowadays. And the definition of racism that I'm going to use for this particular talk is by Nikki Lisa Cole. And she defines racism as it refers to a variety of practices, beliefs, social relations, and phenomena that work to re reproduce a racial hierarchy and social structure that yield superiority, power, and privilege for some, and discrimination and oppression for others. So who are the oppressed that we're talking about today? The oppressed are the people that have been receiving phone calls here lately. Are you all right? The oppressed are people who look like me. So African Americans or black. These are, we are the ancestry of the enslaved. We are those that have come from those that have experienced Jim Crow, civil rights movement police violence, brutality, and even murder, the pandemic, civil unrest, 
and personal loss. So I go back to the question again, am I all right? Not really. You know, it used to be a time I was growing up and my mom would always say, Dawala, when someone asked you, how are you doing? This was not an opportunity for you to unleash your bag of eels. Like my head hurts, I really don't feel that well today. Or in this particular manner, um, you know, all of these things that are going on and we're just not sure as to what is going to happen. But I decided that I would be truthful all the way. So no, I'm not quite all right. I know that I will be all right, but am I all right right now? Not quite. So where do we see the systemic racism within our world, in our country? Well, you certainly can find it in politics, healthcare facilities and organizations, public and private school systems, banking establishments, families. You know, people not being able to love who they want to love without fearing that they will be treated differently because it doesn't look like the norm, whatever that is. Boardrooms, and I'm gonna pause right here and give you some of my truth to some of these things that we are going to talk about. So the boardroom, I have been on quite a few boards and I'm going to give you an example of why I'm not quite all right about this particular incident was on the board and they asked, they said, you know, we don't know many black opera singers. I was very stunned when I heard that because this is the business that you are in and you don't know who the singers are, black, white, or indifferent. I'm not quite sure about that, but I did provide them with a, a very thorough list None of the singers were considered for any of the upcoming performances. So you ask what it is that you can do in order to get rid of the systemic racism. Well, you need to actively seek out people of color to perform in these roles. This is the board that I sat on and not for long because they were just very intentional about not doing what I suggested. So music, remember, is something that is going to be an equalizer, not a divider. Well, arts foundations, another example. Remember in this talk, this is my truth. Arts foundation called and said, Dawala, we need you to come and we need you to take a look at our organizations that are receiving monies from us. We really want to be intentional about bringing people who don't look like the organization to this organization, especially those that are receiving funding. So it didn't take me too long, two, two days to uh, visit these organizations, and these were choral organizations, to see and to recommend to the boards. The problem is you cannot do what it is that you're looking at doing because you don't see these people within the organizations. So as I asked for some information about how the organization's demographics were, the only persons of color that belonged to these organizations were the housekeepers. So you must intentionally recruit people. They need to be on your boards. They need to be the directors. They need to be your fundraisers. Qualified people are out here that need these positions and could satisfy what it is that we are trying to do and that's get rid of systemic racism. Universities, schools of music, we see this even in the entry level 
during the audition process. Why would your audition process not include music, America's music? So we'll talk about what America's music is in just a minute, but why would it not include that as an example? We have many organizations such as the universities that do not care to hear America's music. What are they? Spirituals, gospel, jazz, blues, country, bluegrass, rock, rock and roll, R&B, soul, ragtime, funk, hip hop, doo-wop, pop, techno, house, folk music. Okay, I can go on and on. All of this belongs to us and our academia does not embrace that. Let's get rid of the systemic racism. How about creating ensembles that speak to a variety of the students, the demographics of your students? Personal example, I have a group at the university in which I work named the Verk Singers. And I'm going to share with you how that group was founded. The university singers or the um, university choir, now called the Singing Lambs, <clears throat> was invited to perform at a big conference here in the city. And at this conference, there were people from all over the world. I had been given that information ahead of time as to determine what kind of repertoire we would sing. When I arrived, at this conference, I was met by the person that I spoke to over the phone. And we had not met before. We had just spoken over the phone. And she said to me, I want you all to remain here. I'm going to go in and announce you. And when I come back, then you come in. Oh, but one thing, don't sing any Negro spirituals. Well, my students tell me I don't control my face very well, especially when I get surprises like that. Um, that person went in and I thought very quickly, this is not where I need to be. I instructed my students to get back on the bus and we returned to the campus. I knew this decision could also cost me my job. The students said not a word on their way back to the campus, neither did I, and I went into my office preparing to I, what I knew was going to be to speak with the chancellor of the university. And certainly enough, the chancellor called, asked me what happened, and I told him, and that chancellor supported me. Well, a couple of things bothered me about that you did not trust that my musical expertise of deciding repertoire would be what it needed to be. I'm not quite sure why you didn't because you called and invited me. But as if a spiritual were not appropriate, it could have been. But I just had not programmed any because actually what I did was the students learned the national anthems of all of the countries that were represented there. So let's get rid of this systemic racism. Repertoire within our universities in each of the areas, there is plenty to go around. Instrumental and choral music, um, let me give you an example of when my choirs are touring, a great example of systemic racism. We arrived at our venue. The venue actually was a mosque and there were people also coming into the venue and these ladies said uh, to each other and then eventually to some of the students and I was nearby. I know we're gonna hear some good old gospel music. Now, I'm not quite sure why they assumed that that would be the case, but 
I think you get the picture here. Uh, intentionally, we did not sing any gospel music so that we could have a teaching moment here for those particular uh, ladies that were there. But gospel music certainly could have been appropriate during that particular concert. Let's get rid of the systemic racism. Another example of a uh, situation with my choir was we always try to dress alike for a different reason so I can know where they are. And, um, and then so we can all look professional, but it was one of our leisure days and we had on our windsuits with our university emblem and our icons of the choir, the singing rams. And someone walked up and said, are you all a basketball team? Another situation that really sent me in a direction that I just could not understand that in these days and times, we still have people making an assumption that if you see a group of black children or black people, that it has to be a group of athletes. If they had only read, it's clearly stated, Winston-Salem State University singing Rams. And it, it would have been okay if it was a group, but we were not. There is the stereotype that is perpetuated quite often, even in 2020. We have professional music organizations that are not seeing and hearing we are not seeing and hearing ensembles perform on these national stages, on the regional stages, and in, in these particular organizations in which we belong. That has been a long problem. I do believe, and I am seeing some changes come about. And I do, I do, and I'm going to throw this name out here. ACDA is making a move in making that change. Kudos to you. But a lot of times I have heard that the reason we're not seeing and hearing them is because people are not applying. Well, um, some of those cases, I do know that that is not true because I've applied several times myself. But the other thing that could hinder some of our HBCUs on these national stages is the lack of funding that may not allow them to travel to the conferences that are across on the on another coast. So some of the things we need that we deal with that our sister institutions of the majority institutions do not deal with could hamper our ability to be able to perform. Well, let me tell you that I am beginning to feel all right, a little bit better. The Met has, can no longer say, or opera can no longer ignore its race problem. That's, that's the title of a wonderful article and you all should go out there and pull that up. Opera can no longer ignore its race problem. Just recently, the Met opened up with Porgy and Bess. My heart jumped right out of my chest almost because I even knew several of the people performing. And that has barely happened in many years. But the Met has done a wonderful job looking at what needs to happen. However, what, what is also happening with a majority cast of Black singers, then those people that are underneath the conductors, the stage managers, all of that, they still happen to be white. We don't have a, a good representation in all of our professional organizations that are giving us the diversity that we need to hear and see. And there are plenty of people that can fill these positions. If the instrumentalist or the orchestra wants to end 
uh, or wants to be a little bit more diverse, then we should say you need to end these blind auditions. Be very intentional about placing people of color within these organizations. We even have orchestras of predominantly black or people of color that are professionals that are playing. That needs to happen more often within our local organizations, regional and national orchestras. Just recently, speaking of the Met, um, Morris Robinson uh, Bass said in a talk, and this particular talk was actually a talk that was put together by a wonderful mezzo, Janae Bridges, who was actually asked to perform, but did not feel like she could go there because of what was happening in our climate today. We had just had the murder of George Floyd, and she said, but I'm going to propose something else. Would you allow me to pull some of my friends together and we have this talk? And they agreed. And I tell you, I was so moved by that talk. It currently has 60,000 views. And after uh, Janae pulled these people together, you heard also from many people like Karen Slack, who has her own group of talk um, um, shows, I guess you call it, it's called Kiki Conversations. And then you have the wonderful tenor, Lawrence Brown Lee, and he has his show, The Sit Down with LB. Now, if you've never seen these people before, I don't think anybody can claim that they haven't because they are all over the internet. They are all over and they are talking and giving you testimonies that have been going on for years that you may not have realized were happening. One particular uh, experience that I would like to share before we start listening to some things dealt with uh, one of the uh, particular opera singers that I just spoke of and he had just performed but came after the concert came downstairs and someone asked him if he had a light bulb in order to replace, I think, in the restroom. Then went outside, and I don't know if this was the same performance or another, and someone asked him if he was the driver of the bus. Now, this was the same gentleman that had just received a thunderous standing ovation on stage. But once the makeup is off and the costume is off, we, we are all the same, I guess. And so the assumption is either you were the custodian or the bus driver. That touched me so much because I just could not understand why we would assume that our only place in society in this country would be that of the laborers, even though those positions are wonderful positions. But this was the same person that was on stage. We need to get rid of this systemic racism. Uh, I want you to, I'm gonna stop talking for just a minute and I would like for you to listen to a recording and it's a video actually um, by a wonderful friend of mine, Kenneth Overton, a baritone and my singers, the Winston-Salem State University singing rams in the background. This is Moses Hogan's arrangement of there's a man going round taking names. This was done in 2016. Kenneth's expression of what he was feeling in the wake of social unrest during that time. You may see some, 
and this is a disclaimer, you may see some photos that may be some disturbing images. So I'm just giving you a disclaimer ahead of time to be aware of that. Wow, um, that piece is as powerful today as it was in 2016, 
as it was years before because it you have heard soloists perform this piece but it certainly spoke power to what kenneth was now experiencing and i don't know if you were able to read the script before the performance but he said up until that time he's living in in new york he had never been afraid to be out and about but it just seemed like there was a target on him and people who looked like him men who looked like him our black brothers and fathers so music can speak for us when we certainly don't have the words to express what we are feeling. Another selection, which actually is apropos to today, we have lots of young people out marching and, and singing and chanting and sing out, march on a piece written by Joshua Campbell, a young man from Harvard actually, performed this piece when John Lewis was invited to be the commencement speaker and at Harvard. Well, this particular piece spoke to us, meaning my singers, and this is, I would like for you to listen to this. I don't wanna to give too many words away or the text away for this, but I think it, it is really speaking to what's going on today. And my students embraced this wholeheartedly and were able to feel that this is what was speaking on their behalf. Sing out, march on. The Winston-Salem State University Singing Rams at Norfolk State University HBCU Choral Festival in 2019.
as we are hearing, you know, I've had colleagues in um, on the collegiate and even on the um, public school level to say, I don't, I just cannot find music that speaks about the things that are happening today. Um, and I have been an encourager of my colleagues, music colleagues to, to search a little bit deeper. I've actually helped quite a few people find. But you know, our students are coming up nowadays and we should be encouraging them to write and arrange. And later you will hear of a young lady that just wrote something a few weeks ago that I would like to highlight. But next, the, one of the wonderful groups in this country that has a reputation of speaking truth to power about social ills, uh, about suffrages, is Sweet Honey and the Rock. The next couple of selections is by this group called the Burke Singers, and they are singing Sweet Honey and the Rocks, Ballad of the Sit-Ins, and immediately after that, the women gather. Sit back and listen. The time was 1960, the place, the USA. February 1st became a history-making day. Greensboro across the land, the news spread far and wide. Silently and bravely, they took a giant stride. He the call. Not in this neighborhood, in 
doesn't have no luck. Our kids have everything. What do we have to fear? But what about the ones who say this happens every day? Drugs and violence take our children. How much more death can come our way? The women gather, cry, and tears that fill a million oceans. It doesn't matter where you're living. The women gather, cry, and tears that fill a million oceans. Don't you know? Some bullish find their targets. Bombs can fight on bombs. Some in the hands of babies or officials and their crew. Claim the brother had a gun. In the profile in my book. Running, hiding, taking cover, didn't take the time to look. Somebody's mother, brother, best friend. Oh, women gather, crying tears that fill a million oceans. It doesn't matter where you're living. The women gather, crying tears that fill a million oceans. It doesn't matter where you're living. Okay, all right. Ah, uh, Sweet Honey and the Rock is a group, a musical storyteller that puts it right there in your face. And their, their pieces over the time from when they were founded up until, uh, up until a certain point was just that. Music of the era, music of the time, and telling about what was happening or what is happening. Um, the next particular piece that I would love for you to just take a snippet, this entire work will not be played because it, it is a, a larger work, but many of you may have already, especially my music colleagues, may have already heard of this work. And it's called The Seven Last Words of the Unarmed by Joel Thompson. Um, this particular work has several movements, but it was written by Joel, he said, with no intention of really no one hearing it. He wrote it because he had to get the anxiety of what was happening during that particular time out and the best way he could do that was through music. When it was uh, commissioned and actually performed in Michigan and by the Glee Club there, they went around the world performing this piece. And recently the Morehouse Glee Club has done a similar thing because unfortunately this is still happening. And so I would like for you to hear just how in your face this symphonic group puts it there along with the choristers. The one thing that you will see that I think is extremely profound is this male glee club, which is predominantly white, speaking to something that has been happening, happening to predominantly black people. Well, I think we are seeing that with those that are in the streets talking about, singing about, chanting about Black Lives Matter. Take a listen to this snippet here, this clip 
of seven, the seven last words of the unarmed. Wow. I was fortunate enough to hear the Morehouse Glee Club perform this in 2019 with the Charlotte Symphony Orchestra. And they were on a tour, as I said previously, performing this. Here again, for, for anyone to say that we don't know of classical composers and arrangers is certainly not true, you're just not looking. Thompson is a wonderful musician, writer, and educator through his music. And this particular work, and you can go online and find it on YouTube, it would take maybe 20 minutes to hear the entire work. It is profound. Unfortunately, again, it is in this day and time that we still can sing this. My goodness. The so-called land of the free, remember I told you earlier that our young people are now writing. Their music sounds a little bit different. So the civil rights songs that we heard in the 60s that I grew up with, the We Shall Overcome and Oh Freedom, um, their music is not sounding like that because they are different. And I would like for you to hear something one of my students, Brittany Hedden, senior music major at Winston-Salem State University and also student conductor of the WSSU Singing Rams, um, composed just a few weeks ago after listening and looking at what was happening in the civil unrest in our very own country. The name of the piece again, the so-called land of the free. I am her. That's just a little bit of that work. It's an unpublished work, and I want to be respectful of the composer, uh, arranger there, Brittany. So I, I just want to encourage my colleagues across these United States. I want to encourage all the students that feel that you have something to say. Many times, 
music can say it for you. Many times music is what needs to happen and people are able to receive it a little bit better and differently. I would like to close um, this talk, not close it where the discussion ends here. You need to leave from this place and this space and begin to talk with someone who doesn't look like you and begin to have a conversation. Those conversations, you will not agree on everything, but it is your truth. And what you heard here today is a little bit of my truth about how music is a great equalizer and not a divider. I would like to close with a poem by one of my sister friends, Wanda Granderson Anderson, who is a prophetic and profound writer. She is also an attorney and also a pastor, but I believe, and she just wrote this the other day, but I believe it sums up everything that has been said today. The name of this piece is Don't Hold Your Breath. Whispers and dreams don't know what it means to speak what is in my heart years of excusing, denials and refusing, that which sets me apart, weariness takes over as hearts grow colder. To all of the tragedy around, voices are groaning, hearts are bemoaning, the blood which cries out from the ground. Families are shattered because black lives don't matter and fathers are killed in the street. Our hearts are pounding from injustice abounding and hatred dawned in white sheep. We're inhaling the fumes of bodies exudes from the graves of barren fields. No headstones to mark the tragedies of the dark and the generational pain that it feels. Words unexpressed by the millions oppressed still searching for justice and peace. Silence no more when my feet hit the floor. I am now learning to breathe. Thank you, Maestra Burke, for sharing your profound insight. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now transition everyone into the question and answer session. Please remember to submit any and all questions using the Q&A button. Questions submitted to the chat room will not be considered, and priority will be given to questions about today's topic. Um, looking at the questions submitted so far, Maestra, several, have, several questions have come in um, regarding 
the programming of, of spirituals and gospel music, uh, either by uh, predominantly white choirs or white choir directors? Um, and how uh, would you respond to them when they ask questions regarding um, creating meaningful style, um, not appropriating the performance, and the like? Well, the first thing that I will say is that performing the spiritual or gospel music doesn't belong just to people of color. This is America's music. So we shouldn't be too shy in performing uh, both of those genres of music. I do know that there, I've had friends that have been hesitant about doing that because they want to be respectful and, and be true to the genre. Well, the first thing I will say is if you have that hesitancy, the first thing I will say is we all don't know everything. And as we do with any other genre, if there is someone that you've deemed is an expert in that, ask them to come and assist in clinic with your group. Prepare the group musically and ask them to come in clinic with them. Um, that's always a great place to start. Um, do your research as you would do with any other genre of music. It's no less of preparation for either of these styles as if you were to prepare music of, of the Western European um, uh, area. So please do your research, call the composer and arranger and speak with them about the things that they have written and what they were intending when they wrote it. I, I love to always have my students, if I can, be able to meet the composers and arrangers. Sometimes, and Skyping is, is a, 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 was a good thing. Now you Zooming, you can do all of that and have the composer and arranger right in that area. So first, make sure you do your research and reach out to the experts in, within those areas. Call the composers and arrangers. I've found them to be most accommodating. No one has ever told me no. So, um, and I, I just think that that would be the way to go. Thank you. Another question from a viewer asks, hello, I teach middle school choir in a rural area of North Carolina. I have many black students in my program, but I fear that my attempts to be more cult culturally aware and diverse in my program may spark conflict from white affluent families who have specifically denounced Black Lives Matter and equality in my area. What advice and encouragement can you offer to defend those decisions uh, besides pointing out that the standard course of study calls for diversity inclusion? Thank you so much for your impactful presentation. Yeah. I, um, well, that one of the first things I would have said was that it's, it's no different, as I just said earlier, uh, and it is certainly a music that is inclusive. It is America's music, but um, I would encourage you to make sure to select age-appropriate repertoire and subject-appropriate um, repertoire. Uh, as the age levels or the age limits of those children, there are just things that you would go about a little bit differently in teaching and educating uh, those students uh, about music um, of the African Americans or, or Black um, uh, composers and arrangers and just the subject matter. Let the students compose. You would be so surprised what students would come up with. There's a way to help these students to be creative. Uh, and it would be that, that those students are the ones that are the composers and arrangers. Give them an opportunity to, to give you some words that may be uh, a part of the text of what they are composing or writing. Um, encourage them to do some writing. I am a big proponent 
on having our students to, to speak what's with inside of them. Thank you. Apologies if I mispronounce names here. Um, our viewer, Manicia Nesbitt, uh, asks, as a high school choir director, sometimes the programming of civil rights pieces are oftentimes looked upon as inappropriate for younger singers. Um, do you have suggestions on composers who are performance friendly for our younger singers? Yes, actually you can, there are quite a few uh, composers and arrangers um, and it just depends on um, where you are looking and certainly as you're researching music to uh, program for the year, you need to educate yourself again. Education is the key uh, here with just about everything. You just can't get around it but educate, go into um, the publishers uh, and see what it is that you're looking for. And you've given the parameters here, as you've stated, and I believe you should be able to find something. If you still are drawing a blank, reach out. Don't be shy to call someone. Call me, write me, email me. And if I, what I don't know, I certainly have other friends who do know. So, if you are drawing a blank, please reach out. Thank you. Um, Jean Ashworth Bartle asks, Maestra, are we finally at a major turning point? Are you optimistic for the future? The performances and music I had today, uh, they were trans transformational. I retired 13 years ago after a 35 year career and want to heartily congratulate you on your magnificent work. Wow, I, I certainly want to believe that we are. And, and I'm going to tell you the reason why I believe we may be at a place where things are going to look and sound a little bit different is because it is not only us that are asking for the change. Those who have been privileged and a lot of people have a problem with that word. You just have to understand what the definition is. But those that have been privileged are also stepping up and saying, what may I do? And we have given and provided, and that's what we must be able to do, provide what it is that they can do. They're sitting on these boards. They are at the banks, at the arts uh, councils, uh, at the universities, the board of trustees, they are the ones with power in that particular area. And they are the ones that can assist with the change. And I see that even in the protests, it's not just one culture of people that's marching and asking for change. So I really want to be optimistic, cautiously optimistic in saying, I think, a change is coming. Thank you. Robin Page asks, what advice would you give to choir directors to avoid using uh, quote unquote black music as just ornamental or token pieces in their concerts? Well, you just gave it. <laughs> you just said it. It, it is, that is not um, what music uh, I, I keep saying it's America's music. It's not black music. It is America's music. Are are not the the are not to be used in program as the the good old closer and some happy go lucky kind of thing. Um, I've I've been known to open or to leave someone hanging in the in the middle uh, of a concert before the intermission with those and definitely would not close sometimes with with um, uh, spirituals or or the like but um, you've just said it it should not be done that way in education I can't say that enough if you educate your singers your singers educate their parents who are in the audience and you must educate your audience. Sometimes you have to say a few words uh, before and or after your concert as to what's going on. Or if you're not one that's a speaker or a talker, 
and you really want the music to say that for you, program notes are a great place to place those uh, sentiments. Thank you. Um, apologies again for any mispronunciations. Aya Ueda uh, asks that, or says that they have tried looking for music um, by black composers, but could not find any published uh, specific ones through like JW Pepper or these conglomerate websites. Um, do you have any specific publishers um, who specialize perhaps publishing in black uh, composers? Wow, uh, J.W. Pepper does have black composers. Uh, I'll, I'll, what was I'll, the question? I'll um, also be more specific here. Um, okay. Dean Smith Moore is the specific composer uh, this person was looking for. Okay, Undine, uh, <laughs> Undine Smith Moore. Thank you very much. Yes, Undine Smith Moore. And they were looking, we'll see, a lot of her music actually has been. Um, uh, given to, you might want to check with Virginia State where Dr. Uh, Moore was a professor. There are some pieces that lie within my library of, of music, but certainly it just depends on, on what you're looking for. But uh, you are correct. Um, her collection of music is not resting with um, many of the publishers today. I would be glad, certainly, if you would uh, email me at the university's um, email address. Um, Raul probably can provide that for you. Um, I would be glad to help you do some researching. We do have search engines out here um, of people that have uh, pulled some of these pieces together and uh, music of composers such as um, Undine Smith Moore. Uh, Louise Top Topin, uh, <clears throat> I'm sorry, <clears throat> Louise Toppin is one of those and a very profound uh, researcher. And uh, she's in Michigan right now, but I would be glad to provide you with information um, that uh, Louise has put together with her search engine. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Leah Peer who directs a small community women's choir in Denver, Colorado, asks about how to make connections um, with colleagues uh, in her community, in Leah's community at HBCU to brainstorm future collaborations. Okay, um, ask that question one more time. She says she's tried to reach how, out. How could I go about making connections with a colleague at HBC at a HBCU to brainstorm a collaboration. Oh, pick up the phone and call them. <laughs> uh, I think that I think as simple as that. I do quite a few collaborations within our community here. We are the community uh, of the arts in Winston Salem. We've done quite a few collaborations with the Winston Salem Symphony Orchestra and. Uh, symphonic Chorale. We've recently done collaborations with the North Carolina School of the Arts here. Uh, over the years, we've done collaborations with Wake Forest University, and all it took was a telephone call. Lovely. Um, if any more questions come in after this one, great. Um, if uh, Otherwise, this will be our last question, Maestra. Uh, Wanda G. Anderson thanks you for your awesome presentation. And Wanda asks, how do emerging African-American artists who have very little artistic leverage advocate for a more inclusive and culturally diverse repertoire in the audition process and in uh, procuring roles in the opera world? Yes, yes. Uh, that's, Wanda was the um, uh, writer of the last poem that um, I read. Well, one thing I would like to do is to encourage uh, her or anyone else that is looking to try to do that to reach out to the administration within the Department of Music. It is, it is encouraging sometimes to hear that administrators uh, say that they are looking for people to assist them with 
things that are going on. And I, I've recently spoken with a couple of administrators at some other universities that have said that. It is, it is testy because um, academicians are, are, we are kind of finicky and we have people that don't like to like for us to suggest what they, they should be doing within their medium. Um, but I do believe that it really can be done um, carefully. And, and if you know of any faculty member within those schools of music and have a sidebar conversation with them, I think it's something, especially with the, the nature and the culture uh, as we have it and know of it today, will uh, be amenable to at least listening to you and hearing. The other thing I would like to recommend is a mentor that is in the field already. Seeking out mentors, uh, I think is probably one of the best things. One of the things that I, I teach my students, I, I will say to them, if you don't learn anything else, you need to learn how to do what? reach out to others and to say, listen, I need you to help me help myself. This is what I want to do, something that you are doing. And I really need to know how to go about it. And I just think being able to open up and to say to people, I need your help. I think people will be able to do that. And especially with um, what she is talking about and has, and has asked that question about. There are, I have seen many programs right now uh, that have our artists of color that are coming around and performing concerts for free so that they can see, so our students who look like me can see that this is a field that they are able to, to launch out into. Because when we don't see ourselves, we don't believe that it's something that we can do. I think that's for anybody, any culture. When you don't see yourself doing it or see someone that looks like you doing it, it's very difficult to believe that you would be able to, to break that ceiling and be able to do that. So find a mentor. And that mentor will certainly help you uh, in um, getting through some of the doors and gates as it be. But um, yes, powerful question. Thank you so much. And I, I just remember GIA is a publishing company that does publish uh, some of Undine Smith Moore's music. This was back on Undine Smith Moore, GIA. So you may want to take a look at that. I think striving after God, I, I, if I can remember right off the top of my head. Um, and uh, there, there are quite a few others, but G, start with GIA. Um, we had a question come in right after. <laughs> okay. Um, and I think some of what you, what you said might address this person's question as well. As a young black choral director hunting for jobs in a competitive field. They are in a large metro area um, where they, uh, they are the only black high school choral director um, and just addressing, um, I guess, the competitiveness in the field for opportunity. Wow, yes, yes. I, I understand. I would first say get a mentor and the mentor doesn't necessarily have to be right there within your area, but someone that's going to walk you through to be informed is the best way. I have young people that I've mentored that are not my students or have not been my students in my classroom. I was done the same way. I boldly walked up to someone and said, listen, I need for you to mentor me but because th these are my goals and this is what I want to do. And I see that you're doing that very well. And um, nobody has told me no yet. So I hang in there, get a mentor, talk with them and ask them to help you move through or navigate through this world. They're, these positions are very competitive and, and all it takes really sometimes is a foot in the door. Great, thank you so much.
if your question uh, was not answered on here today, we will include Maestra's email address in the next Coral uh, Conductors Colloquium e-blast. And for now, everyone, that is a wrap. Please help me in thanking Maestra Burke for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you again to our sponsors and a special thank you to our viewers today. We will see you two weeks from today for our fifth and final lecture of this first volume of the Choral Conductors Colloquium with Elena Sharkova, uh, new and rediscovered Russian choral music for your 21st century concert. We will send all of today's lecture materials, uh, Maestra's outline and the archival recordings in the next Colloquium e-blast. And there you can tell us how we are doing by taking the CCC post lecture survey, where you'll also have a chance to recommend a conductor you admire for the Choral Conductors Colloquium Volume 2. If you enjoyed this lecture today, please, please share this free learning opportunity with your friends. You can share our content and like and follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Choral Conductors Colloquium. Last, I hope you will use what you learned today to put beauty into our world. Thank you for watching. Thank you, Maestra Burke. Have a lovely day. <laughs>